So as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. Um, if we can, if we can uh, come together here to uh, uh, give us uh, uh, your attention up here, please. Um, Dr. John Chong is a fascinating character. He is an, uh, uh, a pianist of great ability himself in the classical field, I believe. Um, he's also a doctor and has managed to combine these things into a thriving and extremely helpful business. Um, he runs the, the uh, Musicians Clinics of Canada which has offices here and Hamilton, anywhere else, or just, yeah. Um, and he's treated musicians with repetitive strain injuries, motor control problems, anxiety, depression. It's artist music specific medicine. Because I think as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, if you heard them, I think that this is, this is something that we need to think about and I don't think people in music in, in the music business or uh, workers in music in general think about this stuff enough, at least musicians that I know, and myself included. Um, John is award-winning. Um, he, uh, he teaches performance awareness at the Glenn Gould School and uh, artist diploma programs at the Royal Conservatory in Toronto. He's the medical consultant for the National Youth Orchestra of Canada. And in 2012, he received the Governor General Diamond Jubilee Medal. He's very accomplished, and he's going to present, uh, I think, a fascinating uh, uh, talk right now. So please put your hands together for John Chong. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, David, and thank you very much for all of you coming to this beautiful venue at Jazz FM. I'm going to um, give you uh, some pitches. It feels like um, uh, the bases are loaded uh, with um, Miranda, Matt, and Molly. Hard act to follow, but uh, I want to make it as interactive as possible. So um, that's my background. That's uh, uh, a little graphic to see what I see. Everything's going great. Um, music's wonderful. You're graduating from school, except something might go wrong. How did I get into this? Well, it, uh, I came about it honestly, much like our previous speakers. I injured myself when I was 14 and did, did everything wrong, but there is no right or wrong, but managed to get myself pretty badly hurt at the conservatory. So fast forward many, many years. Um, the field began in the 80s, um, wasn't my idea. And uh, thanks to science and all the new technology we have, we can now start to study and disseminate uh, uh, evidence about what are these injuries and illnesses about and how about going to treat them and prevent them. Uh, I'll also speak on behalf of Performing Arts Medicine Association, which is uh, our international organization. We have our own journal and it's uh, very multidisciplinary. So I wanna focus today on the awareness of performance stress, and I'll get into the science of, of uh, what we've been talking about. So I'm much more comfortable with that piano beside me to play it, rather than talking about injuries, but now in, certainly in sports we're thinking about injuries um, much more. The, the difference is a lot happens in the studio, and we of course admire and adore our wonderful artists. We've heard about it today how to get there, but all those hours and hours. We heard 10,000 hours, probably even more. And it isn't for the money. Uh, we've heard Miranda talk about it, Molly talked about it. Uh, that's some pretty hard data from Kelly Hill. Uh, it's about 16,000 bucks in this uh, industry genre. So I really still don't know what I wanna do uh, when I grow up because I won't grow up, but uh, having uh, left my music career of composition, electronic music, and piano, uh, decided to go into medicine. wasn't my idea. I'm, I'm Chinese, by the way, so you can figure, <laughs> figure out the rest of the story. <laughs> so getting high marks was a, otherwise the rice stick would come out. So I was at McMaster, actually quite asleep at three in the afternoon, waiting to pick up the kids from daycare where upon the organization of Canadian symphony musicians, which happened to be the union, uh, 
wrote to me and said, we need a musician's clinic in Canada. It took me three months to, to uh, reply, which is typical. And luckily we have the Canada Health Act, which goes back to uh, uh, a fellow that um, is the father of our current prime minister. So uh, the Canada Health Act was in there and uh, I made up this slide in 1986 when we started the clinic um, called Madness and we're still uh, carrying on. I guess I should change that to 2018. <laughs> Another 86 slide. This is the stuff we see day in, day out. Pain during, after playing, numbness and tingling, weakness and loss of control. So-called playing-related musculoskeletal disorders. That's the classic definition and without going into a lot of detail, the bottom line is the most important. It's use, which is excessive, for the individual affected. So there has to be an excess. This is the data we have. Um, just highlight it. Uh, we have an 84% lifetime prevalence of injury, 50-50 chance of playing hurt. All the risk factors are uh, listed there from uh, overplaying, not enough rest breaks, not being in great shape, being stressed out, um, et cetera. This is some new data, which um, Probably won't surprise you if you happen to read the news every day. This is the average age of death by musical genre. So we have along that away the types of music and the age of death. So we heard about Tom Petty, and I'll just go backwards, Dolores O'Riordan. Yeah. Oh, we just kind of smoke our, and drink our life away. It's, jazz guys, but uh, you can see it's pretty dramatic compared to the U.S. Uh, expected. The causes of death, again, are um, what you read about in the paper, chronic disease, and of course, a lot of violence and, and mental health uh, uh, issues. This is, a, I'll spend a bit more time on this, it's hard to read. Um, musicians may be up to three times more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression compared to the public. So you know the Olympics is on, hopefully, if you're staying up uh, all night to watch it. So in the background, um, population's about one in five in Canada. So this is British data, so that's where the three times uh, comes from. So if, simple question, are you anxious, are you depressed? And roughly uh, over 2,000 uh, UK musicians uh, responded and said, yeah, to the rate of 60, 70 percent. Just following up on what Molly was saying, poor working conditions, difficulty sustaining a living, antisocial working hours, exhaustion, uh, uh, administrative planning issues, lack of recognition for one's work, the welding of music and identity into one's idea of selfhood, physical impacts of mu musical career such as injuries, and the last but not least, is in issues related to the problems of being a woman in the industry, from balancing work and family commitments to sexist attitudes and even sexual harassment. Okay, so that, that's really um, something to take home. Well, when I started in this, being an engineer as well, I thought, oh, this is easy. This is a slam dunk project. I'll just redesign instruments, get a patent, and then retire somewhere in Malibu. Didn't work out too good. <laughs> so there's a simple issue of a clarinet and static loading on the right thumb. So guess what? If you're a woodwind player, you'll have a lot of right thumb troubles. If you're a bassoon player, you'll have a lot of left thumb troubles. So that's kind of pretty straightforward. The common injuries, uh, the concept to take home is where things get squished. Okay, so you see the yellow thing there is the nerve and muscles contract and then things get squished and get inflamed. So there's, this is a common forearm, uh, repetitive strain injury. We all know what carpal tunnel is, mostly from the uh, electronic gizmos we use uh, very much. Was it 11 hours now? Something like that. And uh, most commonly are um, hard to diagnose but are called proximal entrapment syndromes or thoracic outlet. So issues about posture and muscle tension and affecting nerve 
uh, function as well as blood flow are very, very common. Squished. Squished. Uh, another concept is fried noodles, or I call it chow mein syndrome. Um, so focal dystonia was originally thought that you were crazy, uh, refer to psychiatry immediately, then they got into Botox, then they got into constraint therapy and all kinds of things. But now with the modern brain scanning techniques, we can now see we have chow mein syndrome on the bottom, so fried noodles. You got to be really careful because of the lifestyle issues and exposures to toxins. So we might have a grovelly voice, as Molly said, but be careful. There might be a structural problem beneath the surface. Uh, quick talk about hearing loss. This is the inside of your ear, the inner ear. So it looks like a bombed out area um, anywhere in the world. So that's what happens to the hair cells. So they get bent over and smashed and injured and they don't come back. The exposures in music are actually quite extraordinary, um, well over the, the um, legal uh, uh, criteria in Ontario, but we're not going to shut down all the bars and all the symphonies, of course. So again, you have to protect yourself. So now we have uh, uh, dosimetry just on your cell phone. You can check you know, what the levels are and always carry your earplugs in your uh, fanny pack, which I do. Okay, I'll switch to a bit of biology. Um, uh, musician brains are, are quite different. We know we are different, um, but if we actually look into the wiring or the apps, you can see on the left is the uh, auditory motor tract of a musician and a non-musician on the right. So what fires together gets wired together, gets developed, so you can hear these amazing musicians we uh, heard before, the wiring builds up and it's much stronger. Therefore, there might be some issues about something going wrong during that career. One of them is, is about neurochemistry. So we're gonna get into anxiety and depression pretty quickly and inflammation. This is a very interesting study looking at uptake of dopamine. Everybody knows what dopamine is. Party, that's why we do it, pleasure, reward, mischief. So you can actually see the areas of, that light up in the, in the brain, the pleasure centers, the movement centers associated with music. And that's why we do it, it's not for the money, it's for the buzz. Now, put all that together and some laws of neuroplasticity, what fires together gets wired together. So this, this is sort of a new concept. It certainly wasn't uh, heard of or taught to me in med, med school, but it sort of makes sense. So the, the more you use it, uh, the more it gets fused together. Also, we know from practicing all those hours, use it or lose it. So that's an old, old law. So that's actually what we look like in terms of distribution. So if you happen to be a wind player, you might, you'll have bigger face and, and lip area. If you're a piano player like me, you have big, big mitts. And so it's an interesting concept of why we have uh, different presentations of, of injuries and, and problems. Now, just quickly quoting uh, dear colleague Gabor Mate, who's you know, always in the newspapers. Um, it's not new news to, to us that the mind and body are not separate, but also why are we doing this? We've already heard this numerous times from the previous speakers that authentic self-expression is the key, including but not limited to artistic self-expression. So that's the buzz phrase I want to leave you with on that one. That's what we're all striving for. Yes, pleasure, but also authenticity. So when that doesn't quite work out the way we want it to, we might develop a stress response. So what's the mechanics of the biology of the stress response? Well, it, it comes from stress hormone called cortisol, which is uh, produced by the adrenal glands which sit on top of our kidneys, believe it or not. And there's a connection uh, between the, the brain and various uh, circuits there to the stress uh, hormone production system. And that comes, in, comes into play when the mind and body uh, perceive that there's uh, adversity, which can come in childhood, education, 
work, etc. What is that app or circuit? It's the vagus nerve. Um, simply put, what happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so when everything is all things bright and beautiful, the social engagement system is all perfect, everybody's hunky-dory, and the mind-body system self-regulates beautifully. When you get stressed out, you have an anxiety response, and then when you get overtired and wiped out, the system shuts down. Complicated, but very, very simple. So when you have a, uh, a stress response, Naturally, cortisol is produced, stress hormones produced, the body responds with an immune reaction, a defense reaction, and then it, the predator goes away and it's all good. So that's what goes up must come down, blood, sweat, and tears. That's the normal stress response. However, with some of the issues you've heard about from our previous speakers and what I've alluded to in the data, what goes up doesn't come down, it goes up, up, and away fifth dimension. So this stress system gets stuck on because there's no off switch, if you think about it, right? It's kind of logical if the predator's still lurking around uh, without getting too graphic about me too, well, this is going to be on, or the financial issues. It's just not going to be solved because it just disappears. Now the problem with the chronic stress response is, is extremely hard on the, the physiology of the body. So um, some amazing science has been done that won a Nobel Prize in 2009 uh, showed that uh, one year of chronic stress uh, gives us six years of biological aging, which is kind of nuts so when you think about it. And then, so I'm gonna dissect that a little more. And that's why you see so much, not only injury, but also illness uh, in this population because the stressors are right there. Now the root of all this is, is our normal survival system, which I call the three, three stooges system, which is called the glial system. So th these cells, who look like the three stooges, go and regulate all the neural pathways. Okay, they adapt, they do all the calculations, and uh, control the immune system, control all the neural networks, and as well the conductivity of uh, electrical information down, up and down the neural networks. So you mess with them, and then a lot of bad things can happen health-wise. Here's a fairly complicated schematic, but again, very simple. You have stress from here and there, and you develop this immune response. So now anybody, if you're involved in, <clears throat> in sort of cutting-edge uh, targeted therapy, you can now start to see some of the wear and tear at a cellular basis. Now from the mental health point of view, on the left we have some of the uh, depression or anhedonia, that's lack of pleasure, uh, circuitry. On the right we have issues about anxiety and different uh, neurochemistry. So I'm not here to, to push drugs, uh, far from it, but it, just to give you an idea, it's pretty complicated neurochemistry and there are creative ways to go about um, reducing uh, some of the psychological as well as biological effects of the chronic stress. Now how does this relate to the muscle issues? So most of the patients that come refer to me come because of um, playing related musculoskeletal pain. And yeah, there's some biomechanical issues we deal with straight up and, and, and um, straightforward, but what is new in this that the autonomic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight system, is hardwired into the muscles. You think about it, if there's somebody gonna get you, you might wanna fight them or run away. So it kinda makes sense. Except when you have a story going on in the background, okay, about chronic, uh, chronic stressor, that will actually continue to affect your muscle system. Now is this all just a bunch of funny business or do the Three Stooges actually exist? Well, at Harvard they've looked at it, folks with chronic pain, the three brain scans on the top compared to controls, those without pain, and you can see the Three Stooges glowing in the dark in the brain, so it's, it's real, not just a story made up. Now this is 
really important in terms of music education and how we conduct ourselves as a community. We've heard Molly talk about it eloquently, how she's um, uh, done extremely well in her career and, and showed that there is a zero tolerance for bad THC. So that's targeted, humiliating criticism. Okay, so if you've seen the movie Whiplash, I'm sure you all have, this jazz, that's what it's all about. So it actually lights up parts of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, which is the hub of the mind, right? And you saw that eloquently acted out, as well as the, the pain, not just bleeding hands and the drummer, but actually a phys physical pain from the whiplashing. What are the elements? Well. The movie says it for itself, but that they've actually isolated the types of, of um, psychological maltreatment. And the actual health effect is the same as physical assault. So you're seeing that come out now in the Me Too movement. You know, you just, you just can't do something physical while people are being called on uh, behavioral uh, issues. So the risk to health part of my training is public health. It's not just to be poo-pooed, it's the same as tobacco and asbestos. Okay, so it's heavy duty, and now that's policy in pediatrics uh, at the present time. 